Those who have studied history know that nothing invigorates and empowers an authoritarian regime more than a spectacular act of violence, some sudden and senseless loss of life that allows the autocrat to stand on the smoking rubble and identify himself as the hero. It's at moments like this that the public, still in shock from the horror of the tragedy that has just unfolded before them, can be led into the most ruthless despotism. Despotism that now bears the mantle of security. Acts of terror and violence never benefit the average man or woman. They only ever benefit those in positions of power. This is why Nero fiddled while Rome burned. It gave him a chance to throw out the Christians to the lions and rebuild the capital of the Roman Empire in his own image. This is why Hearst and the warmongers of the emerging American Empire were delighted by the destruction of the USS Maine in Havana Harbor in 1898. It gave them the excuse they needed to rouse the public into supporting the Spanish-American War. This is why Israel attacked the USS Liberty in 1967 during the Six-Day War, strafing and torpedoing it relentlessly for hours in a vain attempt to send it to the bottom. The Israelis believed that the loss of the Liberty could be blamed on Egypt and draw the Americans into war. This is why there are hundreds of documented examples of government staging attacks in order to blame them on their political enemies. In every civilization, in every culture, in every historical period, authoritarians have known that spectacular acts of violence help to further consolidate their own power and control. And sadly, throughout history, there have been all too many willing to allow attacks to occur, to pretend that attacks have occurred, or even to attack their own population in order to further their political agenda. To think that such staged provocations and false flag attacks no longer occur would be as unrealistic as believing that human nature itself has changed, that powerful people no longer seek to increase their power, that influence is never used for deceit or manipulation, that lies are no longer told to satisfy greed or slake the thirst for control. It is to believe that our society is immune from those things that we have seen in every other society, in every other era. In short, it's a dangerous delusion. The people are once again learning the power of this delusion. They are learning the extent to which they have been lied to. They are once again studying their history. The Russians are learning how the FSB was caught planting bombs in Moscow in 1999 during a terror scare that swept Putin into power and stirred the public into supporting the Second Chechen War. They are learning how their autocratic ex-president came to power campaigning on the graves of those his old FSB cronies had killed. The Israelis are learning how Mossad has been caught time and again posing as the very Muslim terrorists they claim to be opposing. They are learning how Israel uses the specter of terror to further extend their blank check drawn on American funds to expand their police state at home and maintain their hardline stance, the world's sixth largest nuclear superpower supposedly threatened by the possibility that one of their neighbors may one day obtain a single nuclear weapon. The British are learning how their SAS officers were caught dressing up as Arabs in Iraq, driving around with trucks full of munitions, shooting at police to stir up ethnic tensions, and ensure that permanent bases could be built in the region. They are learning how Harun Aswat, the supposed mastermind behind the 7-7 bombings, was working for British intelligence. They are learning how British military intelligence took part in IRA bombings. The Indians are learning how the Mumbai attack was helped by a U.S. agent who is cooperating with investigators so that he won't face questioning by foreign authorities. The Canadians are learning how their own provincial police dressed up as protesters in 2007 and threatened violence against other police in order to force a crackdown on peaceful protests. And the Americans. The Americans are learning that there were multiple bombs found, dismantled, and taken out of the Alfred P. Murrah building on April 19, 1995. They are learning that Timothy McVeigh had written a letter to his sister in which he claimed to be in the Special Forces for the U.S. Army. They are learning the bombing was being directed by FBI informants just as the 1993 World Trade Center bombing was. They are learning about 9-11 and the Gulf of Tonkin and Operation Northwoods and their own Army counterinsurgency manuals that teach officers how to commit false flag attacks to blame on their enemies. In short, the people are learning the truth. And now we see the same build-up to a false flag event taking place that we saw in 1995. At that time, the U.S. had a corporate media desperate to fling mud at anyone concerned by the actions of their government, and it had a government that was desperately unpopular. Today, we see the exact same factors at play. 
If anything, the situation today is worse than it was in the run-up to the Oklahoma City bombing, with media consolidation meaning that groups of concerned citizens like the Oath Keepers are being attacked by the controlled minions on both the left and the right. And now it is not just the militia that is being demonized by the establishment. It is veterans and gun owners, third-party supporters and libertarians, anti-war protesters and human rights campaigners, people who are upset with a government giving trillions to the banks that have engineered our current financial crisis. In short, everyone is now a potential terrorist according to the governmental and media agencies that deign to limit our range of acceptable opinion and control dissent. Even the word terrorist means something more than it did back in 1995, now after the false flag attack of 2001 allowed the passage of the Patriot Act, after the boogeyman of al Qaeda gave the NSA the opportunity to, to announce that they were collecting everyone's emails and everyone's telephone calls, after the former White House press secretary came out and admitted that the Bush administration had made up terror threats in order to scare the people into supporting the government, now we know what the real definition of terrorism is. It is governments scaring their own populations into line. But there is something else that's different now from what it was in 1995. The people are learning something else about terrorism. They are not terrorists for speaking out against their government. They are not terrorists for wanting the government to stop selling their children into servitude to pay bankers their bonuses. They are not terrorists for pointing out that the FBI and the CIA and Mossad and MI6 are behind every major international terrorist event. The people are not terrorists because they do not want to see more death. They do not want more destruction. The spilling of the blood of their fellow citizens is not in their interests. Death and destruction only ever serve the governmental and financial and industrial interests who always grow in power and wealth in the wake of every tragedy. Time and again the people pay with their lives and the governments and the banks and the war machine only grows and prospers. The people do not want terrorism because it does not benefit them. It only benefits the existing power structure. And this time, if there is another staged event to blame on the government's enemy of the day, the people will know who to blame. For the Corbett Report in Western Japan, I am James Corbett. We are anonymous. We are legion. We do not forgive. We do not forget. Expect us.